I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. Hey, what's up my homies? Misha Tate taking on Ketlin Vieira, another UFC breakdown and predictions video. Hope you guys are doing well, doing blessed, having a good day, having a good week, man. Man, if Ben Rothwell and the over 1.5 in Song Yadong and Arce come in, it's a clean sweep. But it wasn't meant to be. So we're doing it again, guys. We're going to make our predictions, make our bets and hopefully have a decent card. If you haven't already, please go ahead, Hamzat smash the like button. Alright, let's jump into it. Alright my homies, so starting this card, we've got Luana Pinheiro taking on Sam Hughes. Man, I'm not completely sure if Sam Hughes is UFC calibre. You know, she's had two fights in the UFC. Um, to be honest, man, it's not looked too good. In all fairness, her UFC debut was an extremely difficult UFC debut. You know, you get given Tisha Torres. That's a tough debut. Then you get given Loma Lookboon Me, who is a step down from Tisha, at least when it comes to mixed martial arts experience. Loma Lookboon Me has brilliant Muay Thai, and she, she looked good against Sam Hughes. Tisha Torres, Loma Look Boon Me, both of these fighters look good against Sam Hughes. Now Luana Pinheiro is a judo practitioner, so that means if Sam Hughes crashes into the clinch, she's probably going to get judo tossed to the mat, you know what I'm saying? If you had to choose how Sam Hughes beat Tisha Torres or Loma Look Boon Me, let's say she wins these fights, right? If she did, she would probably have to wrestle. Now, the fact that Luana Pinheiro is a judo practitioner, you know, it's going to be pretty difficult to take her to the mat. So, arguably, Sam Hughes might have to strike her way to victory. Luana Pinheiro isn't the most technical striker, but her hands are pretty quick. They're pretty powerful. So, when I'm looking at who's more well-rounded, who maybe has a higher ceiling, who maybe deserves to be in the UFC, I think it's Luana. If I had to choose who's a better matchup between Sam Hughes and Randa, I'd say Randa. So Luana arguably getting a step down in competition too. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird one, guys. I'm going to side with Luana. I just like her a little bit more than Sam Hughes. My numbers out of 10 times, I'd say Luana six times out of 10. So minus 150 on Luana. But what do the bookies have? The bookies have Luana minus 300. Oh my goodness. So yeah, there is a little bit of value here on Sam Hughes over plus 200. But here's the thing, guys. Unless you think Sam Hughes can win, you know, the value, do you want to take that shot? See, for me personally, guys, you look at Joel Alvarez, right? Plus 200. There's a lot of value on that line. But Joel Alvarez, you know, he's looked pretty good. Sam Hughes hasn't looked good. So when you see plus 200, you can see value. But ultimately, Sam Hughes hasn't looked good. I'm taking Luana here. Minus 300 though, you know I'm priced out. Can't play that. All right, we've got Shailan Nordan Becker taking on Sean Soriano. Low-key, difficult matchup to predict. So with Shailan Nordan Becker, only one UFC fight. We're going to look at that, right? He fought Josh Kulabau. Now, he didn't look terrible, didn't look amazing, Round one, he wins this round, you know, he shows us, look, I'm a wrestler, I'm going to take you down, and this is how I'm going to win. You know, after that first five minutes, Shaila Nordan Becker looked a little bit fatigued, and his striking isn't exactly dangerous. You know, Josh Kulabau kept sticking him with the jab, sticking him with the one-twos, and Shaila didn't have much to offer with the striking. You know, this guy's a wrestler, and you can see that in round one, you know, really, really strong up against the fence with uh, Josh Kulabau. But after round one, it's a different story. Shailan looks tired. Now, Sean Soriano has had more than one UFC fight, but I want to look at his last one, right, against Christos Giagos. The reason why we're going to look at this one is because this was his return fight to the UFC. Same kind of thing with Shailan Nordan Becker, though. If you look at round one with Sean Soriano in this fight, it's looking good, you know? But a different story outside of round one. Christos Giagos has good jujitsu. So yeah, that's the story with that one. But if you look at round one, Sean Soriano, the boxing, you know, looked pretty slick. 
and the low kicks too. So if I'm looking at who's the better striker between Shailan and Sean Soriano, I'm taking Sean Soriano as the better striker. I also think his movement's pretty quick too, compared to Shailan. But if I'm looking at who's the better wrestler, then I'm going to side with the Chinese fighter. Gun to my head. Like flash my guns around a little bit. I go, dude, my mom's going to kill me. I'm picking Sean Soriano. It's a close one though, and difficult to be confident either side. My numbers on this one, I'd stick with the same numbers as the fight I just broke down. I'd say 6 times out of 10, Sean Soriano, minus 150. But we're going to look at what the bookies have. The bookies have Sean Soriano, minus 250. So again, in my opinion, priced out of a play on Sean Soriano. See guys, you've got to understand that when you're making these predictions, look at the line. Does the line reflect the probability on your prediction. You know, I'm siding with Sean Soriano around 60% probability, whereas the bookies have it over 70. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm gonna bet on my prediction, Sean Soriano, I'm paying like a 10% tax. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not gonna pay that for Sean Soriano. So yeah, I hope my breakdown is right. I hope I get the prediction right. But as far as betting goes, I'm priced out. All right, my homies, we've got a fight between Cody Durden taking on Kwai Leng Aori, the Mongolian murderer. By the way, this guy had an awesome UFC debut. It was a loss to Jeff Molina, but yeah, if you've seen that fight, I know most of you guys see that one. Crazy fight, crazy war. So we know what Kwai Leng is all about, you know, you just look at the octagon name, Mongolian murderer. If you're getting inside the octagon with Kwai Leng, he wants to strike. He wants a, a vicious battle, a violent battle. That's what he wants from Cody Durden. Now, if you give Kwai Leng that battle, you know, he's going to take your shots. And if you can't take his shots, you know what I'm saying? He's living up to the octagon name. Now, Cody Durden, decent striking, but better wrestling, in my opinion. Guys, we just had a fight between Sean Woodson and Colin Anglin. Now, some people took Colin in this fight. They expected the wrestling, maybe the result. If I'm being completely honest with you guys, I think Cody Durden might be able to do what some people expected Colin Anglin to do. And that's wrestle. You know, Kwai Leng isn't like a, a 5 foot 10, 5 foot 11 flyweight. Cody Durden might be able to get this fight to the mat. And I'm kind of leaning towards that too. And that's not to say that Cody Durden is the next Daniel Cormier, the next Habib. You know, he's not this super high level wrestler. But when you're thinking of who can Cody Durden take down inside the octagon, he took down Chris Gutierrez. You know, Chris is a pretty good mixed martial artist. You know, guys, this one comes down to what it always comes down to, man. Who can impose their will? If Kwai Leng is able to strike in this one, he might knock out Cody Durden. If Cody Durden can level change real quick, go underneath that lead hook, get onto the legs, get onto the single, into the double, you know what I'm saying? Cody Durden might out-wrestle this guy. Nine times out of ten, it always comes down to who can impose what they've got to do. Cody Durden has to wrestle. Kwai Leng has to strike. Gun to my head. I believe Cody Durden is going to do exactly what Colin Anglin was supposed to do in some people's capping. I'm going to take Cody Durden to wrestle. Now, I did take Kwai Leng in his UFC debut and it was looking good. But Jeff Molina, such a dog. My numbers on this one, guys, I'm going to still keep it close. I'm going to put Cody Durden minus 130, Kwai Leng plus 100. And the actual numbers you've got, Kwai Leng Iori plus 100, plus 105, Cody Durden minus 120, minus 130. So yeah, man, if Cody can get the takedown, that's a minus 150, minus 200 prediction. If Kwai Leng can strike, that plus 100 realistically, in reality, it's like a minus 200. Yeah, my prediction on this one, guys, I'm going to side with that old-fashioned American wrestling from Cody Durden. All right, we've got Terrence McKinney taking on Faraz Ziam. Man, this card's got some decent fights, man. Difficult predictions to make. We're going to spark up. Now, the reason why this one's a difficult prediction to make, if you take a look at what Terrence McKinney done, in his UFC debut, 
You know what I'm saying? That's why it's a difficult prediction. Terence McKinney also has a few submission wins on his pro record. So if he can take Farrar Siam down to the mat, you know, potentially a way to win. Now on the flip side, you take a look at Farrar Siam, debuted against Don Madge, was basically held against the fence in this UFC debut. But then you look at the fights against Jamie Malarkey and Luigi Vendramini. To be honest, guys, I think Jamie Malarkey beat Farrar Siam. If it wasn't for the last 10 seconds of that last round, you know, Jamie Malarkey was going to get that win. I'm pretty sure. Now against Luigi Vendramini, this one was quite close too. You know, you look at what Luigi done in that last round, you know, nearly finished for us. So yeah, for us, CM hasn't exactly had like a, a clean cut performance yet. Whereas Terence McKinney did, you know, his UFC debut. About as clean as it's going to get, you know what I'm saying? Now, if I'm looking at this one, trying to picture the striking in my head, I do kind of see for us, CM dictating the striking. You know, he's got some nice low kicks. The, the boxing's pretty clean, but not exactly super powerful. Trying to land his punches, then get out of the way, get back to using the, the movement. You know, he's not a, a knockout artist. He's not a Justin Gagey. Farrar Siam is looking to exploit the technicality of fighting. He's looking to use the technical side of striking. Hit and don't get hit. Whereas Terence McKinney, you know, you look at the debut, he's looking for chaos, he's looking for violence. Hey guys, I'm always gonna be honest, man. If it's a difficult prediction to make, I'm gonna say that. I believe this one is. I'm gonna side with Farrar Siam. Not super confident. I think his movement, his speed, the technicality, it might be the difference. I'm not super confident in that. You know, I like what I see from Terence McKinney in that UFC debut. My numbers though, guys, yeah, keeping this one straight down the middle. Minus 110, both of these guys. And the actual numbers you've got, yep, both of these guys, minus 110. Spot on, you know, it's spot on. Farrar Siam is going to win this fight if it looks more technical. Terence McKinney is probably going to win this fight if he can take Siam to the mat or bring Siam into a dogfight. Good fight. Guys, we're going to spark up on this one purely because Loma look boon me. You know what I'm saying? Look at that name. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? All right, so we have Loma look boon me taking on Lupita Godinez. Really sick matchup, if I'm being honest. Loma look boon me is arguably one of the best female Muay Thai practitioners in the UFC. You know, her kicks, her kicks are devastating. If you get close, knees, elbows, it's all Muay Thai with Loma Look Boon Me. Now, Lupita Godinez, the boxing's pretty good. The takedowns are pretty good. The grappling's good. She's a good fighter, you know? Debuted against Jessica Penne. This one, you know, there's not much to be super impressed with. It was her UFC debut, though. Then she had a, a really... Dominant fight against Silvana Gomez, arguably a mismatch. Her last fight was just three weeks ago against Luana Carolina, where she done pretty good. You know, she took down Luana, and Luana's a big girl. You know what I'm saying? And that was above her natural weight class. You know, so she's fighting a girl who's bigger, and she's still able to take her to the mat. But outside of round one, guys, you know what I'm saying? Lupita couldn't get Luana to the mat. And it became more of a striking battle. And Luana is more of a striker. You know, she's a Muay Thai fighter. Loma Look Boon Me, also a Muay Thai fighter. But nowhere near as big as Luana Carolina. You know, Luana's what? Five foot six, five foot seven. Loma Look Boon Me is five foot tall. So if you're looking at ways on how to beat Loma Look Boon Me, it's always going to be take this fighter to the mat. Get the takedown. Because you don't want to stand and trade with Loma. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to let her use that Muay Thai. You don't want to eat those kicks. This one's pretty simple. You know, if Lupita Godines can take down Loma Look Boon Me, get that top control. Maybe a submission. If Loma Look Boon Me is just kept to using her Muay Thai, you know what I'm saying? It's going to look good for her. My prediction, guys, I'm going to side with Lupita Godinez. Purely because if you can take down Luana Carolina, I'm more than sure that you're going to take down Loma Look Boon Me. Yeah, my numbers on this one, guys. I'd put Lupita around minus 170. 
and the actual numbers we've got. Lupita Godinez minus 150, Loma Look Boon Me plus 120. You know, that plus 120 on Loma Look Boon Me is going to look great. It's going to look great every second she's not on the mat. But as soon as Lupita can take down Loma, that plus 120 is not going to look too good. So yeah, I'm going to side with Lupi. All right, guys, we've got Rafa Garcia taking on Nathan Levy. Hey, guys, I've got beef with Rafa Garcia. Yeah, I've got beef with this guy. You know, some people might be thinking, what do you mean you've got beef? Yeah, I've got beef, man. Chris Grootsmacker going to the body like that against Rafa Garcia. You know what I'm saying? I've got beef. You know, that bet wasn't even close. You know, when you lay down a nice unit bet on Rafa Garcia against Chris Grootsmacker and it goes down like that, yeah? No, I'm only joking, guys. Only joking. You know, all respect to every mixed martial artist, win or lose. If I win my bet or lose my bet, whether they win or lose, you know what I mean? It's all respect. Only kidding. But yeah, Rafa Garcia, man, against Nasrat, he debuted against Nasrat on short notice. And you, you kind of expect him to lose that one, right? But you see the heart in the loss. And then you're thinking to yourself, you know, you looked good against Nasrat. You lost. You was expected to lose. Against Chris Grootsmacker, that's a matchup you've got to be winning. You've just got to be winning that. And it looked horrible. His cardio didn't look good. The grappling on top. He even got that top control and just couldn't do anything with it. His striking defense was non-existent. The way Chris Grootsmacker went to the body, it looked like a knife going through butter. You know what I'm saying? You know when you're putting the butter on the toast? Yeah, the knife goes through the butter, just slices through it. That's what it looked like when Chris Grootsmacker was going to the body. It looked like that, man. Amen, Chris. You look great, man. You look great. All right, we've got a newcomer here in Nathan Levy, a karate practitioner that also has some pretty slick grappling. You know, you look at the kicks of Nathan Levy, you can see that karate style. But if you look at the grappling side, you know, if this guy can clinch you, the trips to the mat look great. Now, when the fight goes to the mat, his top control is strong. He looks strong on top. So whether this one's striking or grappling, I kind of think that Natan Levy's going to slice through Rafa Garcia like a knife going through butter. You know what I'm saying? That has to be my prediction. You know, I even think Natan Levy can get takedowns in this fight too. So if Rafa Garcia... If the striking's not going too well and he tries to grapple Natan, Natan might take him down. Overall, I'm just preferring Natan Levy. I'm preferring the newcomer, especially when you see Chris Grootsmacker go to the body like that, man. It didn't look good. My numbers on this one may be a little bit harsh. Maybe I'm, I'm just basing this off of Rafa's fight against Chris, but I'm going to put Natan Levy at least a minus 200. And the actual numbers we've got. Natan Levy, minus 120. Minus 130. What's going on here? Man, did the bookie see what Chris Grootsmacker did to Rafa Garcia? Did they see that? All right, we've got Tucker Lutz taking on Pat Sabatini. Man, to be honest, guys, this is another decent matchup. You know, I've made some money on Tucker Lutz. I've made some money on Pat Sabatini. If you look at the well-rounded game Tucker Lutz has... There's not much to be disappointed with. You know what I'm saying? The low kicks are good. He's got knockout power. The wrestling's good. The cardio's good. The IQ. Tucker Lutz. It's looking good. And you see that in his UFC debut against Kevin Aguilar. You know, you see that. Now, if you look at Pat Sabatini, this guy's a wrestler. When he takes you to the mat, then it becomes, you know, heavy wrestling, heavy top control. Mixed in with some jujitsu. He's not much of a striker. So if this one stays striking, you know, I'm leaning way more towards Tucker Lutz. Tucker has to keep it striking though, you know, because Pat Sabatini is going to come with that takedown. He wants that takedown. You know, who has better jujitsu? Pat Sabatini, all day. Who's got better wrestling? Pat Sabatini, wouldn't say it's all day. I wouldn't say it's like a massive difference, but the better wrestler is going to be Pat Sabatini. If Tucker can stay on the feet, if he can stay striking, use the kicking, use the punching, you know, he's going to beat Pat Sabatini. But if Pat Sabatini can just make it a hard-fought battle 
where he says to Tucker, look, I'm going to shoot. You've got to defend this. And then after that, you know, if he's got to do it again, do it again. You know, shoot again. All right, here's another one that you've got to defend off. And here's another one, another one. You know what I'm saying? Turning into DJ Khaled, man. <laughs> another one, another one, another one. But yeah, that's what Pat Sabatini has to do. You know, if he's not getting the takedown on the first attempt, you got to go again. Because if you don't go again, now we're in a striking battle. And you're not going to win a striking battle. So yeah, guys, this one comes down to who's going to impose their will. It's a difficult prediction to make. Both of these guys have made me money. If I had a gun to my head and I had to make a pick. And pull it up. I would pick Pat Sabatini. Like I said, guys, if it doesn't happen on the first attempt, I think it, it might happen after that. And I think Pat Sabatini is intelligent enough to keep trying. So yeah, the relentless game, the takedown game, the heavy top control, I believe that will be the result. If I had to make my numbers up for this one, if I had to put the lines in, I would say Pat Sabatini around minus, minus 150, I think would be fair. And we've got Pat Sabatini minus 170, Tucker Lutz plus 130, plus 140. So yeah, it's not a lot of tax on Pat Sabatini. I believe his line should be minus 150 and the bookies are saying minus 170. So yeah, if you want to play Pat Sabatini, in my opinion, there's not a lot of tax that you have to pay. But I will still probably fade this one. You know, it's a good matchup. All right, my homies, you know what time it is, man. It's time for a smoke break. If you waited to smoke with me, amen. If you've been smoking this whole time, double amen. If you're not a smoker, but you enjoy the smoke breaks, that's a triple amen, gang. Let's go. Hey, I hope you guys are doing well, doing blessed, having a good day, having a good week, man. Let's go. All right, this is my Patreon, at UFCGA. And that's where I'm going to be placing all of my bets for this card. There is only one way to get my bets. And that's on my Patreon. So yeah, cop yourself a membership. And by the way, guys, a massive, massive thank you to all of the people that have recently joined my Patreon. And to that, I want to say amen. You know, I'm glad to have you guys in the Discord chat. The Discord chat is becoming an army. All right, this is my Instagram, at UFC Lay. All right, so the smoke break topic. Guys, the smoke break no, sorry, the smoke break question. The question on this one, I want to ask all of you guys, what is your second sport? MMA is number one, obviously. Now, I know not everyone is going to think that. You know, some people might be listening to this prediction video and thinking, yo, MMA is obviously number two, number three. But yeah, the question is, what is your second sport? If mixed martial arts didn't exist, what's number one or what's number two? Smoke break topic, guys. I want the smoke break topic this week to just be gratefulness. So yeah, be grateful for everything you have in life. You know, gratefulness, true gratefulness is waking up every day, you know, and just, just being amazed. You know, look around you. Look at this. This is crazy. This is life. I get to experience this. And that can be just looking around, you know, looking up to the sky and just, wow, this is crazy. This is crazy. Maybe I've just done too many mushrooms, too many psychedelics, smoked too much weed, but yeah, man, just be grateful. Look around, you know, don't look at your wrist. Look at the watch. Don't look at the car. Don't look at all this materialism that you have. Look at life. Look around, man. This is crazy. You know, whoever designed this, whoever put all this together, you know, how intelligent, you know what I'm saying? All, all praise to God. You know, we are the experiencer, experiencing the experience. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of trippy. Almost like you're the painter and the observer of the painter. And you're also the painting itself. You know what I'm saying? Trippy stuff, guys. But maybe I've just done too many mushrooms. So yeah, man, let's get into breaking down this main card. But before we do that. Amen. Let's go. All right, we've got a matchup between Adrian Yanez and Davy Grant. Now, if you haven't seen Adrian Yanez fight before, this guy is basically mini Masvidal. Yeah, so when you think of Masvidal, you're thinking of the boxing, right? Same thing with Adrian Yanez. He's a mini Masvidal. 
But to be completely honest with you guys, if I had to pick who's got the better boxing between Masvidal and Adrian Yanez, man, I'm siding with Adrian Yanez. No downplay on Gamebred, yeah? Gamebred is, is an OG. But Adrian Yanez, you know, this guy has got elite counter punching. So that means if you make a mistake, you know, if you're throwing your punches and you make a mistake against Adrian Yanez, he's not just going to slip your punch. He's going to slip your punch and return his punches. You know what I'm saying? He's a really good counter puncher. Now, Davy Grant isn't really this technician. He's kind of dangerous. Yeah, that's his octagon name. It's Dangerous Davy Grant. So what he's trying to say with that is, look, I'm a dangerous guy. I'm going to throw some kicks. I'm going to spin. I'm going to jump with a knee. I'm just going to get dangerous and crazy. And if he can bring you into that game of you're watching what's coming next, you know, you're, you're trying to respect his craziness. If he can bring you into that game, he can knock you out. You know, we've seen him do it against Jonathan Martinez, against Martin Day. But against Adrian Yanez, I'm not sure it's going to happen. I'm not saying it can't happen because it definitely could. You know, anything can happen inside the octagon. We see it every week. But I think if Davy Grant makes a mistake, Mini Masvidal or Adrian Yanez, as he likes to say... I think he's going to punish Davy Grant. So ultimately, guys, I've got a side with the prospect. I've got a side with the guy that I believe is going up the weight class, going up the rankings. And between Adrian Yanez and Davy Grant, I'm going to say that's Adrian Yanez. So yeah, that's going to be my prediction for this one. Most likely a TKO. Davy Grant is pretty tough, but it's not the powerful shots that hurt the most. It's the shots you don't see coming. Now with Adrian Yanez, man, if you make a mistake, that shot comes quick. You don't see it. It's going to put you down. So I'll take Adrian Yanez, most likely a TKO. Maybe a little bit harsh on the betting line, but if I had to make lines for this one, I would say it's over seven times out of 10 for Adrian Yanez. Maybe not eight times out of 10, but then again, pretty close. So let's put Adrian minus 350. The actual numbers we've got. Adrian Yanez minus 250 up to minus 270. So yeah, the bookies are like, yo, if you want to play Adrian, we're going to make you pay a bit. But in my opinion, there's still value on the Adrian Yanez line. You know, some people may look at it and think, you know, minus 250, minus 270. Is there really value here? In my capping of this one, I've got Adrian Yanez close to 80%. Minus 250 up to minus 270. This is below 80%. That's got to be the pick. It's got to be Mini Masvidal. All right, guys. So we've got Joanne Calderwood taking on Taylor or Tyler Santos. Now, Santos, man, this girl's pretty good. She fought like five weeks ago, six weeks ago against Roxanne Modafferi. Had a really clean performance. You know, it was a clean one. Now, I would say this is a step up in competition to fight... Joanne Calderwood from Roxanne Modafferi, a completely different type of fight. You know, Joanne Calderwood has a lot of experience inside the UFC. She's fought some good girls. She's a scrappy girl herself, you know. She's got some good Muay Thai striking. But here's the thing with Joanne Calderwood. I think she makes too many mistakes, you know. I look at her fight against Jessica I. Now, I predicted that she would win in this fight, and she did. But there's just some mistakes, man. I think she ends up in the clinch way too often in this fight. And even when it's not in the clinch, you know, just getting too close to the clinch. I could kind of see how Jessica I was going to win during the fight. And it, it was kind of scaring me. It was scaring my bet on Joanne Calderwood. Against Lauren Murphy, this was a close fight. But yeah, I think the right decision, you know, Lauren Murphy with the grappling arguably the result now if she's gonna beat tyler santos maybe it's a takedown but joanne calderwood isn't a wrestler you know she's not gonna double leg you put you in the air then put you on the mat i kind of see a striking battle between santos and joanne calderwood and if i had to predict who's gonna win that striking battle man i'm leaning more towards the brazilian not because the brazilian is like way way better at striking it's more to do with Joanne Calderwood being nearly 36 years old. You know, she's been around for some time and I feel like she's got to start slowing down. The mistakes are going to be 
happening a little bit more. And you just kind of wonder, you know, is she still as hungry as what she was maybe two or three years ago? It's a decent matchup and I would still say it's a step up in competition for Santos, but I'm going to say she passes this test. I'm going to stick with the Brazilian to beat Jojo Calderwood. Not too sure how confident I am. I'd say... I'd say slightly over 6 times out of 10. So I'd I'd say around minus 180. But what do the bookies have? The bookies have got Tyler Santos minus 300. My goodness. Alright, we've got a matchup between Rani Yaya taking on Young Ho Kang. Man, what is this? What is this matchup, man? Ain't nobody got time for that, man. But then again, last time I said that, it was Chris Barnett. So yeah, can, can one of these guys shock the world and make a, a massive statement? I'm going to say no, but I hope I'm wrong. If you haven't seen Ronnie Yaya fight before, this guy is all about jujitsu. You know, 36, 37 years old, he is getting up there a bit. But if he can take you to the mat and get that top control, then he's in the world of jujitsu. He's going to look good. So I'm going to say this one comes down to the takedown defense of Kang. If Kang can keep this fight standing, if he can keep this fight striking, then he should beat Rani Yaya. Kang arguably has one of the best submission wins in the UFC. It did come against Guido Canetti, which isn't like a, a high level matchup. But if you're getting a triangle choke synced in and your back is against the fence and you're in the air, you know what I mean? That is one of the best chokes in the UFC. Is he going to do that against Rani Yaya? absolutely not you know if anyone's going to do anything remotely close to what he done to Guido it's going to be Ronnie you know Ronnie Yaya has way better jujitsu than Kang but I would say Kang is the better striker I'm not going to bet on this one because Ronnie Yaya kind of scares me with that takedown if he gets the takedown you know it could be the bet done so yeah one of them ones I'm going to take Kang because Ronnie Yaya is 36, 37 years old. And Kang is 34. Now that I checked that. I mean, if there's a, if there's a gun to your head in this one, good chance you, you're not making it out. <laughs> My prediction's going to be Kang to keep it striking. And if he can do that, he's the winner, in my opinion. On the flip side, of course, if Ronnie Yaya takes it to the mat, he's the winner. My numbers, I'd put Kang around minus minus 130 but what do the bookies have the bookies have these guys both minus 110 you know and that says it all the bookies are like yo play it if you dare bro play it if you dare i'm not gonna do it you know you the bookies are daring me but i'm like nah bro i'm a pass on this one all right my homies moving into a matchup between michael chiesa or chiesa however you want to pronounce it taking on sean brady man this is a really decent matchup and the reason why it's a decent matchup michael chiesa has really good jujitsu but on the flip side sean brady also has really really nice jujitsu if you're looking at who has more experience inside the UFC, that's going to be Michael Chiesa. But if you're looking at who's got the momentum on their side, who's doing better currently, that's going to be Sean Brady. Now, you could say that's because Sean Brady isn't fighting the same level of competition as Michael Chiesa. And that would be a fair point. Now, looking at the striking, who's got better striking between Michael Chiesa and Sean Brady? Sean Brady is a way better striker than Michael Chiesa. If I'm trying to think back to when Michael Chiesa was doing his best work from a striking standpoint, I would actually say it was in his last fight against Vicente Luque. I remember he was on the outside sticking the jab, sticking the one-two, and he was having a little bit of success. If I'm thinking about the striking of Michael Chiesa prior to his last fight, you know, there's not many times that Michael Chiesa is looking good in the striking so let's say these two guys get inside the octagon and they're only allowed to kickbox you know sean brady all day who's the better wrestler between michael chiesa and sean brady you know this one's more difficult i don't think you can say sean brady i wouldn't be super confident saying michael chiesa but this is going to be the difference in my opinion i feel like when michael chiesa gets that takedown his top control isn't the strongest. It's not the, the most secure. He kind of falls off the top. 
And Michael Chiesa is pretty good in those scrambling situations. So if he takes you to the mat and then you can get out from underneath, he'll scramble into, into a new takedown or take your back. You know, so if he can't keep the top control, he kind of rolls with it. You know, you're trying to escape, then you escape. But now Michael takes you back. I think against Sean Brady, if he can't keep the top control, I'm not too sure how the scrambling situations are going to go for Michael Chiesa. And that's primarily because Sean Brady is a really decent grappler himself. You know, he's a black belt on the mat. He knows what's happening in these wrestling situations. So if Michael Chiesa can't dominate this fight with his grappling and he's left to strike more than not, I think he's going to lose that type of fight. And I'm not even going to count out Sean Brady to get the submission. You know, he can get a TKO. He can get a submission here. His jiu-jitsu is that good that I wouldn't be shocked if he took the back of Michael Chiesa. You know, Kevin Lee has submitted Michael. Pettis. Vicente Luque. Even Masvidal back in the day. You know what I'm saying? So Sean Brady, he might submit Michael Chiesa. Out of 10 times, I would say it's over 7 times. I would put Sean Brady around, I'm going to say minus, I'm going to say it guys, I'm going to say minus 300. But what do the bookies say? The bookies say minus 160, minus 150 on Sean Brady. Minus 150 represents 6 times out of 10 or 60%. I think it's above 70. So it works both ways guys. Sometimes you may think the bookie is making you pay tax and then other times you may think you're giving me a line at a price I believe is too good to be true and that's where you make the bookie pay. You know what I'm saying? You make them pay and if you can get it right to your level of capping, that's how we win money. You know what I'm saying? We have to look at the lines that we believe are correct or at least the lines that we're not paying all of that EV, we're not paying all of that tax. The only time that paying all of that tax is a problem, the only time it's a problem is when you lose. You know, to give you guys an example, say you pick Adrian Yanez to win, but you have Adrian Yanez around 65% probability. If you've got him around 65%, but the bookies have him over 70, you're paying tax. But the tax you pay on Adrian Yanez, it's only a problem if you lose that bet. So you have to balance how much tax you want to pay and, you know, pick your spots. Is this one where I'm going to get stung? And am I willing to take a chance? For me personally, I'm capping Sean Brady over 70% and the bookies have got it at 60. So there's a 10% difference. So yeah, guys, I'm liking Sean Brady on this one. I think his wrestling's good, his jiu-jitsu's good, his stand-up is better than Michael Chiesa. You know, how does he lose this one? It has to be Chiesa with the grappling. Because if he doesn't out-grapple Sean Brady, or doesn't at least prove to us, look, if you bet on Sean Brady, you're wrong. I'm the better grappler. If he doesn't do that, ultimately, you're left with a kickboxing fight. And who do you favour in a kickboxing fight? It's Sean Brady. So yeah, that's going to be my prediction. All right, man. Ketlin Vieira taking on Misha Tate. I'm going to start my breakdown by saying this is a difficult prediction to make. In my opinion, it is a pick -em. Now, Misha Tate, the former champion, she came back to the octagon, right? She got a fight against Marion Renault. Now, Marion Renau isn't exactly a high-level fighter at this point. You know, she has got some good jiu-jitsu, but... You know, she's a, she's a stepping stone, let's be honest. Or she's a return fight. And it looked that way, you know. Misha Tate got in there and the wrestling was the difference. Me and my Patreon had a nice bet on Misha Tate too. We got that line nice and early, like minus 120. But yeah, this is a much different fight against Ketlin Vieira as opposed to her return fight against Marion Renau. Now, that's not to say that she can't beat Ketlin Vieira. You know, Misha Tate could definitely win this fight, but it's going to be more difficult. Without a doubt, it's going to be more difficult. Now, if we're going to look at the opponent, Ketlin Vieira, analyse her game, you can see that her boxing is vicious. It's violent. I remember picking Irene Aldana to knock her out, 
not to knock her out, actually. I took her to, to win that fight and arguably would have been a decision. But Irene Aldana shocking a lot of people that night. You know, most people would have felt that if there was going to be a TKO that night, it was going to be Ketlin Vieira. Like I say, man, her striking is nasty. So if I'm going to make a prediction on who's got the better boxing, who can win the fight in the first 10 minutes with the striking, I think it's going to be Ketlin Vieira. But here's the problem, right? This is why it's a difficult fight to predict. Outside of those 10 minutes, Ketlin Vieira might gas out. Now, if we're looking at evidence where her cardio wasn't too good, look at the fight against Yana Kuniskaya. You know, she could have easily won that fight, but she gassed out. You know, you look at the last round against Yana. Ketlin was winning that whole round, but she gassed out. And when Yana got top control, you know, just a few punches stole that round. And that's because Ketlin Vieira was holding on for dear life. You know, she wasn't coming close to doing damage or stopping the fight. She was just holding on for dear life. So let's say it goes outside of 10 minutes, it leaves round two. Misha Tate might take down Ketlin Vieira and potentially, you know, a ground and pound stoppage or a submission. Or we could have like a 2-2 going into round five where it's anyone, you know, whoever takes round five, that's the winner. Or you could have Ketlin Vieira breaking the nose of Misha Tate, breaking her face inside round one, round two, and she gets a TKO stoppage. You know, there's a couple ways this fight can go. And the probability of Ketlin winning and the probability of Misha winning, I think those probabilities are pretty close. It's not 70% to Misha. It's not 70% to Ketlin. I wouldn't say it's 60% to either girl. I think it's a pick em. Inside the first 10 minutes, I favour Ketlin. I think she can break the face of Misha. But like I mentioned, guys, if we leave that 10 minutes and the damage isn't the result, if Misha's in round three, you know, I think the tide starts to shift. But then again, let's say Misha gets a takedown round one. You know, that could be the start of Misha showing us, look, it's going to be this type of fight. You know, it's a pick em. It's a pick em in my opinion, guys. I'm going to side with Ketlin Vieira. I think round one, round two, Ketlin Vieira is going to be able to strike more than not. And inside those first 10, you know, she might break the face of Misha Tate. So that's going to be my prediction. I'll take a Ketlin Vieira TKO inside the first 10. My numbers on this one, guys, I'm going to put both of these girls minus 110. Because if we get outside of round two, prepare for this one to be all Misha Tate. And that's not to say that Misha Tate has like a Nate Diaz cardio. It's just to say that Ketlin's going to be tired. And at that point, it's for Misha Tate to say, look, I'm tired. She's more tired. I'm going to change this fight now. Now I'm going to get the takedowns. You know, my nose is maybe broken. I'm bleeding. I've, I've got a busted face, but I'm going to go get a takedown this round. And if you can do that at that point, you know, you can maybe change the change the outcome of the fight. It's a good one. It's a pick em. I'm taking the Brazilian to land damage round one or round two. Now the actual numbers. Yeah, the bookies have got it that way. We've got Ketlin Vieira minus 110, Misha minus 110. Some books have Ketlin Vieira plus 100. So if you haven't got plus on her yet, maybe wait a day or two. You will get that. So yeah, guys, that's my breakdown on the main event. Ultimately, I do believe it's a pick and match up. It could go either way, but I'm going to side with the Brazilian. As always, my homies, leave down your main event prediction, co-main event, underdogs, parlays, all of that good stuff. Hey, my homies, remember, keep your eyes to the sky, never glue to your shoes. Mac Miller. All right, peace.